3, 9. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly. Can we pray anywhere we're at? Yes, we can. And he said this, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction. And he answered me, Out of the belly of she Sheol I cried, And you heard my voice, For you cast me into the deep, Into the heart of the seas, And the flood surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight. Yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The waters surround me even to my soul. And the depth closed in around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the mornings of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord, my God. When my soul fainteth within me, I remember the Lord, and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. So the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. There's a lot there. And it's just not the fish swallowing Jonah, and not the fish vomiting Jonah, but what was going on inside of a whale was critical. It happens in our life, folks, that Many times we get swallowed up and just, to, just with this life. And it's no, it's no real comparison of this story. But I want to I point out some things to you in this story. One of them is Jonah's confinement. He needed to get along with God. Why did he need to get along with God? Because he was running from God. You know, the Christian in this world is more miserable, I believe, and my soul is more miserable when we run from God than when, when we're lost and didn't even know God. But now that I have tasted of God and know how good He is and how, how He is for me, and when I run from Him or disobey Him or I don't want to do it, Lord, I find myself very miserable. And the Lord made a, prepared a great fish. Now you've got to think about this story. God knew Jonah was going to do this. This fish was prepared beforehand. He was at the front or back or sides of the boat. When Jonah was thrown over, and he was, Jonah was swallowed up. I would suggest to you today, the fish is not the miracle here. The miracle is God's divine grace. That's what it is. It was God's way of giving Jonah a second chance. Think about it. If you were thrown into the waves of a raging sea, it was going to be certain death for you. He deserved it. In fact, God demands justice. God could have brought a shark. If he wanted Jonah to die, he could have brought a shark. Do you understand? So what about this great fish that God created for this particular purpose? To be transportation for Jonah. I'm not sure what it was. The scriptures use that term, great fish. But I want to share something with you. The average sperm whale is 20 feet long, 15 feet high, and 9 feet wide. Try catching that on your little Zebco. 
he's a big one of the the biggest mammal or what our animal in the world matter of fact in february of 1891 a whaling ship spotted a large sperm whale in the vicinity of the falkland islands two boats were launched shortly they harpooned the whale the second boat attempted to get uh get uh, get harpooned into the whale also and in its process two men fell overboard they have, were both assumed to have drowned but later on when they hoisted the whale into the ship and removed its blood or bla blubber i get it right and hung the whale and opened up his stomach they found james barkley one of the men that had fallen overboard he had been in the stomach of that well for over 24 hours, unconscious, but still alive. You didn't know that, did you? So Jonah wasn't the only one. He recovered and went back to his job. I think I would find another one. <laughs> God chose to use a fish to rescue Jonah. And that's exactly what he did. You may think, what, I can't, this is too much for me to comprehend. This is, this, this story is too crazy to be true. If you're having trouble believing Jonah, you're probably going to have trouble believing the Red Sea when God divided it so that Israelites could go over. You might have trouble believing they parted the Jordan River. But see, this is all true. Matter of fact, Jesus proves that it's true. In Matthew 12, 38 and 41, he says this, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. No sound shall be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the, fit, the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. What's Jesus saying? That story took place. That's your sign that they will bury me, I'll be in the grave three days, three nights, and I'll rise again. There's your sign. You know, a man made a living by, here's your sign. No, the type of fish is not the importance of the story here, or how great the fish was. The importance of the story is God's mercy and God's judgment at the same time. With Jonah had been thrown in the sea, like I said earlier, and God didn't prepare the great fish, Jonah would have suffered loss. He would have died. He couldn't have made, he couldn't make it. God didn't want Jonah dead. He deserved, Jonah deserves a break. Jonah deserves mercy. Yet he's disobedience. God's got to get his attention. Let me ask you, how does God deal with you when he needs to get your attention? Just hope I'm not on a boat and they throw me overboard. I hope he can get my attention before I get that far in the life. But God will get your attention. This personal transport that he used, three days and three nights in the belly of the well, and the fish was commanded to vomit him out on dry land. Now I wonder how fast the fish actually swam. Because God had him vomit Jonah out exactly where he wanted Jonah to be. I don't know how fast the fish swam. Doesn't matter. What matters is God's got his purpose done. So along with that transportation, Jonah had this private sanctuary, if you want to think about it just for a moment, in the belly of this well. So what is the sanctuary, by the way? It's a place where you encounter God. You can know that you have encountered God when he has your attention. Many times when we come to church here, and we fellowship together. We worship together. A while ago, I, no doubt, I felt God's presence. 
The moment I walk into God's church, I feel his presence. After we pray and after we sing and after we share the word, during all this time, you feel God's presence. So this is his sanctuary. But Jonah had a mobile sanctuary at that moment. Think about what happened in the fish. I cried out for help. That's a logical thing to do. I might have, might have done it when I was going overboard. At least before I reached the tonsils, I would have cried out for help. Because, see, there's theologians that said that he didn't start praying until three days later. Wrong. I'm going to speak for Jonah here. When you get to heaven, you can ask him yourself. I think he started praying when they tossed him overboard. Maybe not. R.T. Kendall wrote this about this event. The belly of the fish is not a happy place to live, but it is a good place to learn. And Jonah had to learn. So three days in a smelly, dark fish belly, he pondered his situation. He had a lot of time to do some soul searching. Folks, we don't need to go there. We don't need to reject God or disobey God and end up in this miserable place in life. We don't need to do that. One man wrote the most terrifying aspect of Jonah's dilemma was when he realized that God had almost given up given him what he wanted that was throw me overboard Jonah wanted to run from God he had no idea the separation of God what it will bring and how it would cause Jonah to want to repent and what he's saying there is this Folks, I know what it's like to follow the Lord, and you do too if you're a Christian here today. When God speaks to your heart, you know what that feels like. And when you separate yourself from God, you know you don't like that. It's a terrible feeling. And you don't want to do it. So what we see is that Jonah got alone with God in the belly of this fish. But the voice of God came through loud and clear. No obstructions. If you ever, you know, in many times I heard people talk about renewing their faith and rededicating their life to Christ, and I understand exactly what that means because they strayed far away from God. But Jonah here, he heard the voice of God in the belly of this whale. If he can hear the voice of God in the belly of the wells, surely we can hear it in church or in our private sanctuary or in our private prayer time. Surely we can hear God's voice. So he cried out to the Lord because of his affliction. What would you pray? What would you pray? If you were in the belly of the whale, my personal thought, like I told you before, Lord, save me. Well, he's done done that. He's done done that. If you're a Christian here today, if you're not a Christian, then he has not saved you yet. He's wanting to save you. Have I ever met a man, a woman, boy, or girl that God does not want to save? No. God wants to save them all. It's God's will that all should come to repentance. That's what God's will is. So what did Jonah pray? How was it effective? You know, I found out hanging upside down from a ladder 20 feet off the ground is the effective position to be in prayer. <laughs> or when you're going down the road 70 miles an hour and Somebody just can't wait because they're impatient and they pull out in front of you. I found that situation's good for prayer. There's plenty of situations we get in good for prayer. And I will tell you what, we shouldn't have to be in the belly of the whale. 
to commune and fellowship with God in prayer. But however, that happens sometimes. But what was Jonah praying? Your bellows swept over me. I have been banished and got me by my, my life is, was fading away. Your holy temple I will look toward. Worthless idols meant empty nothings. That's what that means. Salvation is from the Lord. Where is all that coming from? Psalms. He was praying the word of God. This is where it gets really important now, folks. He was praying the word of God. It was critical for Jonah's survival to pray the word of God. I mean, oh, come on, how are you going to get out of this fish? What's going to happen here? First, God spoke to Jonah's heart. Secondly, God guides our thoughts. And you know what? Our thoughts, if they're on God, then we have thoughts already in our heart because we have placed the Word of God in our heart. And so what are we going to pray? We're going to pray God's promises. God, you said if I'm in a mess, and I'm going to give you East Texas terms, you'll get me out of it. God will get you out of it. God will deliver you. Some may say, well, you know, the pastor prayed for these people and they kept dying. That wasn't deliverance. If they're Christians, folks, that's total deliverance. <laughs> so I don't know what you're thinking. I mean, when I pass from this world, my, the, I'll be with Jesus. What total healing is that? It is. So God, God, God guides our thoughts through the word of God. One man wrote, God's word is a physical representation of his thoughts on a level and in a language we can comprehend. Jonah's thoughts were unlike maybe sometimes God's thoughts, but the word of God guided Jonah to understand and acknowledge God's thoughts about him. Well, God, you could have picked another way. I could be riding on top of this whale. But God shows you right in the well. God's word was a cleansing effect for Jonah's life. He had to soften Jonah's heart. Jonah's confession needed, he needed that confession. We, we need to confess to God our faults. Come on church, all of us in here, oh, we're all perfect people. You know, we often say, you know, the church is perfect until you join it. No. Church is never perfect. People are never perfect until they stand in the presence of the Almighty God. We're in a training session down here, folks. God is training us. God is shaping us. God is getting us ready. I want, and, and if any of you have arrived and God says, I'm done, you're done, I, we're finished, you're, you're ready, you're perfect, let me know the formula. Because I've, I found out many times I have not arrived. And as Paul said, I press on for the call. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look toward God. Okay, so this is what I need to share with you this morning. I said all of this, so I get to this. I got five minutes if you're looking at the clock, but we don't look at the clock around here. I recognize your hand at work in me. Number one, when God's speaking to you, you need to recognize his hand at work here. He threw me in the depths. He's, I have banished from his sight. But yet the Lord speaks to Jonah in the well and talks to him. You need to recognize God's hand at work in your life. And another thing we need to do, we teach this quite often on Sunday mornings, turn your eyes and look to God. Put your eyes back on him. Jonah said this, he said, I will once more look at the holy temple. Where else is there to look in this life? Who else has the answers in this life? No one. So we look to Jesus. 
and I thank God for his compassion and his love. For you raised me, my life from the pit, as Jonah said. Wasn't all of our lives in the pit? They were. And sometimes, well, folks, we, we almost feel like we're headed there again in our Christian walk. We don't need to do that. So he confessed. What would Jonah possibly have, what would he have to be thankful for in the belly of that whale? Well, I'm thankful I'm in the belly of this whale. I'm thankful for all these stomach gases. This acid, this seaweed. I just love this smell. He had nothing to be thankful for. He had something to be thankful for in the Lord. Jonah was not thankful that God had delivered. He wasn't thankful of his situation so much as he was thankful to God. I'm trying to say, you know. Every situation looks like it's impossible sometimes in life. We run across these areas, we think, it's impossible for God to get us out of this mess. But what does God do when we look to him, when we recognize his hands at work and we look to him and we thank him for his compassion, what does God usually do? He brings his saving grace. For us by grace we've been saved anyway, and then he brings us saving grace, he brings us mercy in our lives. And then what do we do? After we've done those three things, we do this. We renew our commitment to God. Repentance. Without obedience results in failure. Well, you say, well, well, I'll tell you what, Jonah, boy, I mean, if I was stuck in that situation, I would repent too. Yeah. Repentance is without obedience. Repentance without obedience results in failure, as one wrote. True repentance requires change. Let me say it this way. Is it possible for us to be honest to God about our sin? Yes, it is. If we acknowledge our sin and acknowledge God is just and, and he will forgive us of our sin, then what do we do? We change. Truly, repentance requires change. And God was changing Jonah's heart. A man, I wrote this story down because I found it interesting. A man of a certain church was known to rededicate his life on a regular basis. Now, some of us are that way. And he always prayed the same prayer. Lord, remove the cobwebs from my life. Upon hearing that prayer time and time and time again from the pastor, the pastor whispered this prayer to the man. And Lord, while you're at it, kill the spiders. <laughs> you get the meaning behind that? While you're at it, kill the spiders. We demand some change here. I mean, you know, shouldn't be ready to rededicating your life all the time. Make a change there. Keep heading towards God. Don't find yourself there again. So the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah out on dry land. Just a little side note here. How far can you get from God's presence that he's not there? I love that about God. Because I read you a scripture, and I can't remember, it's in Psalms, I believe, that talks about going as far up in the skies and the universe, you're there, down in the depths, you're there, you're everywhere. You're, you're not be able to leave God behind. He's always present. Jonah tried his best. I mean, it's logical. It's very logical when you want to look at it for a moment. If you're running from God... What direction is that? 
Jonah thought it was toward Tarshish. He didn't read his Bible. I guess maybe he didn't know that part about Psalms. If I go to Tarshish, you're there. If I go down to the depths, you're there. If I go into the belly of this well, you're there. This is the good thing about God. My friend, you'll never, ever, ever be able to run from the presence of God if you're his child. He'll always be there. Where you're running to, he will be there. So what can we learn from this story? We can learn to say yes to God. Never run from the Lord. <laughs> because it, uh, Jonah will tell you that God is in Tarshish. God is in the sea. God is in the well. You'll never be able to run. Scripture is full of these stories that tell us that God is a God that loves man, that he will, he will bring them back from wherever they were at to have fellowship with him again and again and again. In fact, the Bible tells us of a murderer and an adulterer that gained a reputation as being a man after God's own heart. Tells us about another man that said, I will, I don't know you. Oh, I don't know him. Just cuss it. I don't know him. And yet he's one of the greatest church builders ever was. Because of God's mercy. Peter. I'm talking about. David was the first one she didn't know. In the book of Acts, you meet a man that persecuted and murdered Christians and tried to get them to confess that Jesus was not God. The apostle of grace, the servant of Jesus Christ, you know him by the apostle Paul. Tell me that God can't change a man. My friend, he can change a man. He changed you if you're in Christ today. So here goes. Let's close this and ask the Lord to do a work in our heart. The story of Jonah doesn't remind me of just the great fish in the belly of the whale for three days. It reminds me of God's mercy. He loved Jonah like he loves you. You're not going to run far. You may try, but God loves you. He's after your heart. He's after you. Why don't you give your life to him? Some of us in here may need to give our life to Christ for the first time. Some may need to just say, Lord, I have strayed away from you. Lord, I've gotten too involved in the world. Lord, I've just, you know, Lord, I need to come back and just fellowship with you. Won't you do that today? It's your choice. I got a well if you want to get in the belly, if that'll help you. But it shouldn't. Come to Jesus. Let me ask us to bow our heads and close our eyes for a moment. I just wanted to ask you, where are you at with the Lord? Because church, I'm speaking to a room full, I feel like mostly Christians, there may be a few people here that don't know the Lord. But where are you at with the Lord? Are you running from him? I hope not. I pray that wherever you run to, you're going to run straight into God. So you might as well give up right now. And say, Lord, why did I stray from you? Why did I run from you? Why did I say no to you? Let the Lord work all that out in your heart today. Let him speak to you. Let him call you. Let him put you back on that path of fellowship with him. Walk with him. Talk with him. Fellowship with him. Life is good when we're walking with the Lord. So won't you do that today? And maybe someone here that doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So, well, Pastor, I don't even know if I believe any of this, these stories. You know what? It's by faith. It's by faith. I pray that the Spirit of God would touch your heart right now, that it's by faith that you understand that our Lord Jesus Christ came through a virgin birth into this world lived a sinless life, and 
died on the cross for the sins of the entire world, yours included, and was placed in the depths of the earth for three days, three nights, and rose on the third day. Let me tell you something. That is by faith. My friend, the Spirit of God, I pray that he calls on your heart today that if you don't know Jesus today, you can. If you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he will come into your life. You know, you know what he'll ask you to do? He'll ask you to confess your faults before him. And we need to do that. And we need to turn from our wicked ways and accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And for the Christian, you need to do the same. You need to just turn away from the world if you're following the world and start saying yes to God. And your life will be much, much better. Lord, I pray that, God, that your people would answer the call today. Lord, that they'd fellowship with you and walk with you and, and turn back to you, Lord. And I pray, God, that, that you will minister to their hearts. I know you will. And I know, Lord, all is good when we're in fellowship with you, walking and obeying. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. God, do your wonderful work now. We ask it in Christ's name as we pray. Amen. Well, I ask you to do me one more favor when you leave. You're not actually doing me a favor. Actually, you're working in God's kingdom. I'd like for you.